Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking to a guest and we're very excited to get to it. But we have a little bit of feedback first from our Evolution podcast. Yeah, a friend of mine, Sean, wanted me to dispel some myths that I reflected in the videos. He's an expert in the history of the book. And there are some what seem to me quite widespread and commonly believed uh, myths about the history of the book that I found in numerous places that I reflected in the video. So I've got some clarifications, therefore, to make. First of all is having to do with the word parchment from Pergamon. Now, first of all, the etymology is correct. Parchment does right. indeed come from the, the city name Pergamon, but it's not because parchment was invented there. Is that what you said in the video? I said it was developed there, right. which is a little vague, but mm -hmm. not quite correct. So in fact, the earliest in instance of parchment, for instance, in Egypt goes back to the 20th dynasty, that's 1195 to 1085 BCE, so, so quite reasonably old. Quite old. <laughs> There is this uh, widely reported story that Ptolemy... Which Ptolemy? <laughs> good question. Alexander the Great's general, like the first Ptolemy? Probably the okay. first Ptolemy. He uh, refused, supposedly, to export Egyptian papyrus to Pergamon, and that's why they supposedly developed... Expertise in parchment. Expertise in, okay. in parchment. But this seems to be a later story. In mm. fact, what it just seems to be is that Pergamon was a center of production for parchment. Right, so um, they exported a lot. So they exported a lot of it, and this myth grew out of that, right. that fact. Okay. So they're not, in fact, the originator of, of parchment. Most of the etymological sources I checked, by the way, repeat this myth. So mm -hmm. a lot of uh, sources need to be updated. A few of them with kind of slightly hedging language, what like uh, was said to have originated or mm. supposedly. Yeah. I mean, I think it's reasonable to say that the word parchment comes from Pergamum potentially because many people who used the word believed, believed it came it to be from true. Pergamum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why the, the word comes from there. I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how to, that's why the turkey is called the turkey. Yeah. Not, it's not untrue it's that not it, untrue. people thought yeah. that yeah. it came from Turkey. So it does seem to be an ancient belief. I'd be right. interested to, to hear if anyone has any sort of early references to this right. uh, to, to figure out exactly how far back this myth goes. Right. But interestingly, the one place that seems to get it exactly right and identifies this as incorrect is Wikipedia. Well, so well you done. know all the etymological dictionaries, they they kind of blew it, but <laughs> Wikipedia <laughs> got it right. Wonder if Sean edited it. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. <laughs> The other myth has to do with this method of folding parchment to produce books. Book sizes. That book sizes, about, yeah. the various book sizes. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be any evidence of this before paper. This is true for paper. This is how, you know, paper yeah. books are produced. They're folded in various numbers and then collected into gatherings right. uh, to produce books of different sizes. And then the folded, the folded bits, bits are, are cut, cut yeah. at the end. Yeah. yeah. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence that this was true for parchment. And in fact, as, as Sean points out, it doesn't even make a lot of sense because parchment would be very difficult to fold like that. Because it's very thick. It's much and, thicker yeah. and, and stiffer. The source for this idea, as far as I can tell, at least the source that, that I mainly got it from, was an excellent blog, Got Medieval, who is, which is also written by a medievalist, a medievalist who works on manuscript mm -hmm. images, mm -hmm. not book production. Mm -hmm. So that may be the source of the error. But it's a seemingly rel reliable source. He seemed to know what he was talking about. And so that's that's why I, I ran with that idea. Yeah. It has been widely reported in a number of other sources, all based on that original blog post. So right. it crops up in Wired and Nidorama and you know right. various other places online. Which is undoubtedly why Sean was so annoyed to see it in your video. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think he may be waging a bit of a one-man campaign yes, to get indeed. this information taken down. But again, if anyone has any more information about this, mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to hear it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's good. We certainly don't want to spread misinformation any more than we have to. <laughs> it will undoubtedly happen sometimes, but as always, if you have corrections or clarifications or you think we've gotten something horribly wrong, please let us know and we will always be happy to bring it up and, and look for what we've gotten wrong. But now it's time to turn to the main topic of today's podcast. Today we're very excited to bring you an interview with Baba Brinkman, an amazing musician whose career really exemplifies our approach to knowledge and learning. 
Baba is a Canadian rap artist and an award-winning playwright. He's best known for his rap guide series of plays and albums, with which he has toured the world and enjoyed successful runs at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and Off-Broadway in New York. These cover topics like evolution, religion, medicine, and most recently, climate change. He's also pioneered the genre of lit hop, with his adaptations of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Gilgamesh, Beowulf, and more. He joined us for a conversation from New York, and as you'll hear, he had another special guest, his three-month-old baby, contributing from time to time. At the end of our conversation, Baba has allowed us to add a couple of tracks from his past and current albums, so stick around to hear his fantastic work. And now, let's get straight to the interview. So welcome, Baba. It's great to have you on the show. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. All right, so... Normally when we have guests on, we have a question that somewhere along the way we ask, and it seems almost redundant with your work. So I'm just going to get it out of the way right at the beginning, because we normally ask, so are there any places in your work or in your life where you see unexpected connections between things that people probably wouldn't think of in the same breath? Uh, are there parts of your life where you have overlaps between two disciplines, for instance? And that seems your stock in trade. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so rather than I'm, ask uh, for one example, <laughs> I was going to say I'm I'm very I'm very monotone in my interests and unitary, and I only really do one <laughs> thing and try never to do any hybridizing or cross pollinating. I really try to avoid that if I can. Yeah, you only do one thing, which is everything. <laughs> So maybe you could give us a little insight into how important you think it is to be able to do that kind of hybridization and pick from different different disciplines, different interests, and how that kind of came about for you, that crossover. Sure. So I, I think what I'm going to do is go right back to the beginning, which was, I guess, in 1998. I was planting trees in the summer for my summer job. I was midway through a comparative literature degree, um, studying medieval, renaissance, romantic, a wide range of poetry, and I was an avid hip-hop head, but I was not a rap artist. I was just a rap fan. And at the time, I was looking for a subject for my thesis, and I was sort of wrestling with this... Um, conundrum, which is that I noticed that modern poetry failed to capture my interest spectacularly. Basically, if it was written, you know, after the nine, like 19, if it was written in the 20th century, I was, I, I was not, not very impressed with it. Maybe with a few exceptions, you know, T.S. Eliot, there were a few, there were a few lyrical poets, but I, I was um, sort of, struggling with this why why do I like dead poets so much and <laughs> and recently alive poets I find boring and at the same time I started thinking about rap and I had this sort of aha moment where I I realized that sort of rap is the natural inheritor of the poetry traditions of English literature and I was uh, a Chaucer fan already mm -hmm. and so I thought about Chaucer I thought about Shakespeare William Blake and John Skelton and and the sort of uh, people who really um, like to look for the the natural cadences and the the lyricism and the rhythm of the English language and find unexpected surprising rhyme patterns and I had this sort of epiphany moment which I still remember I even remember the like landscape there were all these big slash piles all around <laughs> and it was muddy and I was in Alberta and I was planting trees and I was like well maybe rappers uh, you know aren't just poets in the vague sense but are actually specifically more like old English poetry than like new English poetry and that there should really be two categories which is poetry in English since modernism and poetry in English before modernism which inc and also including rap <laughs> you know, <sort> of <laughs> like um, right. ly lyrical poetry that's meant to be heard versus printed mm -hmm. poetry that f for which the sound of it is a secondary consideration because it's intended for a silent readership so from that idea came pretty much everything else because on the one hand I decided I was going to do at the time I thought I'll do a PhD thesis on this uh, but I only <laughs> ended up doing an honors thesis and a master's thesis uh, because it was you know by the time I finished my master's I wasn't really trying to be an academic anymore I just wanted to be a rap artist <laughs> because from that <laughs> moment also in a way came this idea that okay well I'm this middle class white Canadian suburbanite how could I possibly participate in hip-hop culture in a way that's that's authentic in any way mm. um you know so i i think that that sort of question had always been preventing me from 
from writing, even though I was writing poetry and I considered myself a writer, I never wrote rap lyrics and I never would claim to be a rapper. But when I had that moment, I was like, well, if Chaucer was kind of the rapper of his time and I want to be the Chaucer of this time, then the only logical thing for me to do is become a rapper. Um, so I both <laughs> sort of tackled that as my thesis subject and did this whole sort of um, parallel cultural evolution comparison between the Canterbury Tales and hip hop freestyle battling and at the same time I started writing rhymes and the rhymes I wrote were like I'm posturing like I'm the offspring of Jeffrey Chaucer and I was like um, for a challenge I'm known to approach talent shows with poems that I stole from Edgar Allan Poe's lips opium hits dope Alexander Pope's wits I was Samuel Coleridge in a trance when I wrote this and my lyrics were all sort of boasts and brags about how I was the inheritor of all these poets that I was studying uh, in my <laughs> lyrical stylings and um, you know then from there it was sort of like well if you can translate Chaucer into rap then could you translate Darwin into rap and could you do mm -hmm. you know environmentalism or medicine or climate change and so this you know what I do which your audience may not know yet is uh, I've created this whole sort of series of rap adaptations of various ad academic subjects but it really came back to that moment of noticing a similar Similarity between rap and archaic English poetry uh, in mm -hmm. contrast to contemporary English poetry and wanting to explore that for my thesis. That's very cool because, you know, your your first album, The Rap Canterbury Tales, came out right around the time that I started teaching Chaucer for the first time. As a graduate student, as, yeah. Yeah, and so I immediately, of course, ran out and bought that album <laughs> and started playing it to my students. And I even looked up your, at the time, your thesis and this sort of blew my mind, this connection between, you know, this, the whole idea of oral performance mm -hmm. uh, now and oral performance, you know, in the Middle Ages. And that connection was just, it was so perfect for me. Yeah. And at the same time, so you were doing that in Chaucer and I was doing my PhD in classics. So I'm a classicist and I teach that now. So for me, of course, the links to oral poetry in the Homeric tradition were obvious as well. And from what, you know, once you'd, once you'd made that link and I have always tried to make that connection to hip hop when trying to teach oral formulaic poetry, when trying to explain, you know, why does Homer sound the way he does? Why does he use, I know you know all this, but uh, why does he use epithets? Why does he use formulae? Yeah. Why did he why did he use long hair decayans as the adjective yes. in that line and bronze skin yeah. decayans as the adjective in that line? Well, exactly. only uh, because exactly. of the improvisational demands of the cadence of this um, mm -hmm. sextameter verse that he was writing in. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. And and then the transition from that to Virgil or to later poets who were so literary and who didn't know why he was using them there and started using formulaic epithets, but in an ornamental way rather than a structural way. And that, and that transition, which I think is one of the fascinating things about how conventions become unmoored from their practical purposes. Which is just, just was very similar to how a lot of rappers end up put, filling their lyrics with battle lines, even though they're not battling anybody. So they'll be you know selling a record yeah. to their adoring fans, and the record will be like, you suck, you're pathetic, you don't have the skills. And yet the fans are like, who's he talking to? But it's actually a carry <laughs> forward of the battle rap tradition that the rapper started from. Yeah, it's a it's a convention that's become part of the gen generic convention. It's mm -hmm. the convention of the genre. Uh, it comes from a structural form, and now it just is ornament. And I mean, that is that's sort of how genres always work. But it's it's fascinating to be able to trace those parallels, and I do think it helps. It is still at least a contemporary parallel. Yeah, so it, it it's great to be able to make those uh, connections and then to also feel like I'm not making them just from an outside perspective, but that people who actually, you, who work in it and who can do it yourself, validate that comparison. <laughs> It's not just me being an academic and thinking, oh, everything works like Homer. <laughs> well, I haven't, I haven't dabbled. I, I've done Beowulf and Gilgamesh and the Canterbury Tales and the Kalevala, but I haven't dabbled in Homer yet. But I, I got to say, it's, uh, I know. it's calling to me. I've got a copy of the Iliad on my shelf, and I keep glancing over at it like, maybe I should start doing some Homeric lyrics one of these days. Well, I was, that was one of the things I was going to ask was, why no Homer? <laughs> It'd be so useful for my classes. Could you get on that, please? <laughs> I am, I'm sorely tempted. 
would would take the right block of time and the right opportunity for um, you know I, I'm I'm usually like working towards some kind of like I'm I'm working on a new show right now to get it ready to premiere at the Brighton mm-hmm. Fringe Festival in May and then Edinburgh in August and I kind of I write I oh, write wow. towards events so I need an event that's suitably yeah. uh, tailored for a Homeric epic and I'll prepare one in advance of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah because it of course would be a fairly big task it's not a it's not a small story to try to sum up well i don't know if i would have the 27 hour long version but um (laughs) there might be some summarizing required yeah just a little (laughs) so that must have been a a steep learning curve then not only developing the 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 sort of idea of the connection but developing the the skills the actual you know rapping skills that was the difficult part right there. <laughs> the <Yeah>. idea came <laughs> easily. The the skills came very hard. And at the same time as trying to do the academic portion of it and, and all of that, I'm not surprised you decided that trying to split your attention between both of those possible paths was not going to work. Yeah, well, my professors were were sort of traditional medievalists, not hip hop heads, mm-hmm. let's say. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> there there was definitely some pushback when I was in grad school. A uh, kind of like I actually remember one of the notes at the end of one of my Chaucer essays for a medieval course. It said, "Excellent work, A plus. Now let's just forget about hip hop and focus on Chaucer." <laughs> Oh. And I was like, nice try, but Chaucer's dead and hip hop's alive, <laughs> so therefore it's more interesting. But, you know, for me, part of the, the thesis initiative was about, you know, finding a way to connect uh, an otherwise sort of esoteric, detached mm-hmm. course of study to something that I felt had a pulse and was of the moment and not just me, but a whole generation seemed to care a lot about. That was a way to to make relevant a uh, literary theory degree course in a way Mm -hmm. to connect it to something living to a living tradition and to reinvigorate then the older tradition not just as a gimmick to make it cool but also to make the point that it used to be a living tradition itself Mm -hmm. what we're studying is the artifacts that are left over from a vibrant time when the people with the creative juice to rise to the occasion produce the works that we now study in these boring classes and we need to look to today Mm -hmm. to try to find the people that will be elevated to that status in the future Um, there's this sort of like Mm -hmm. illusion of nostalgia where we think things from the past had higher uh, artistic or intellectual merit because they get more attention Mm -hmm. in universities but that's actually you know the same for any time Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare in Shakespeare's time Uh, It took generations of scholars to elevate him to Shakespeare. So the next Shakespeare is alive today. And I would say uh, rappers are where you look for him. Well, it's funny. I was looking for for a quote for another purpose that I want to bring up later. I was looking through some Horace and I was looking through... um, that's a thing I do. But I was looking through his epistle to Augustus about the about poetry. And, and in it, he, the passage that I was just looking at was exactly that, where he says, he complains that everybody thinks old poetry, Greek poetry and old poetry is better. And they put down current poetry in the Augustan period because it's new. And he says, well, <laughs> how do we decide? Like, do we say, okay, a hundred years? Is that the cutoff? What if somebody has been dead only a hundred years minus a month? Is he not classic? Is he too new? Well, if that's true, then how do we, what about a month before that? And if you roll it back, when do we make the cutoff? How, why is everything dismissed simply because it's new? The Greeks had never liked new poetry. We'd never have got to where we are. It, you know, so it's exactly <laughs> that. So if you really want to say we've been saying that forever, <laughs> yeah, that was, and then a Horus is now the classic. Which in a way makes Horus a kind of pre-Darwinian thinker because it's an anti-essentialist argument. No, there's not an mm-hmm. essential quality that makes a species some immortal defined type, but actually you're going to have a, grad- a gradiated process where you know each organism is born to the same species as his parents and yet over enough generations you get massive change and that's probably he's pointing Mm -hmm. out that the same process Mm -hmm. is true of literature yeah that things move by degrees and there's no place at which you can say ah well now you know this is what objectively makes a classic this is what objectively makes a new unimportant thing and everything's in a fixed form and there can never be innovation so yeah Absolutely. I mean, obviously he wouldn't think in Darwinian terms, but I do think uh, he was definitely proponent of change with modifications of a time (laughs) in literature. And that definitely is, I think, one of the really 
fascinating things, uh, the connections that you make, is that you bring the idea of oral performance, not only applying it to, you know, to look to rap Canterbury Tales, but then you bring it into the Rap Guide to Evolution, you bring it into the latest album, Climate Chaos, you know, looking at at, at the, the sort of analogy that you can make between oral performance and those those mm-hmm. other areas. Yeah, the first projects were about the literary traditions. The literary traditions were my focus at first, and now I'm trying to mm-hmm. um, sort of ap- apply them in practice to a variety of subjects. Mm-hmm. But I like that not only are you using it as the medium for the message, uh, which is great and interesting in its own right, and we can talk about that more, but also making the parallels between the creative process and the literary process and the development of genre to other seemingly unrelated things like Darwinian evolution or performance like, feedback revision. Yeah. 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 Or the um, freestyling, the idea that you need free to mate free. Free to mate free in the newest album, yeah. Well, in a way, this whole process is just a, a matter of mining my hip hop literacy for new ways to, uh, new, new connections to draw from it. Because a, a lot of this stuff, you know, a lot of the rap references and hip hop culture references, I come by honestly just from being a big rap fan and listening to tons of rap music. Mm-hmm. But I think mm-hmm. there's more going on there than most people give it credit for. So every time I'm working on a new show, uh, my new show that I'm working on right now is about the neuroscience of consciousness. So I'm um, going back to going back to the old school hip hop and, you know, looking at what do rappers say, what's the difference between what, what does conscious rap mean and what is the attitude of rappers towards the idea of of sentience or to the idea of a soul, for instance, and what does neuroscience say about the existence of a soul and soul music? OK, what what does soul music become when we realize that we don't have a literal soul? We just have a, you know, a soul made of tiny robots, as Dan Dennett says, uh, the robots <laughs> being our neurons because there's really nothing else in our heads but neurons uh, and, and organic material. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the hip-hop connections are always emerging. Reminds me of uh, my mother is a poet, and uh, as an adult, she uh, learned to horseback ride. And immediately she started seeing everything in terms of metaphors from riding. She just, uh, riding became her overarching metaphor and everything she could see in the world around. She said, you know, that's just like when I whatever and it had to do with writing she ended up writing a book a book of poetry called learning to ride doing that metaphor but that habit of looking for metaphor and analogy in everything and anything i think it's a very poetic habit yeah i think i think that's exactly right and the people that the people that we end up studying are the ones that you know had the clearest eyes for finding surprising connections so in your newest album, as we've been saying, you come to the topic of climate change. And this seems to me to be coming at a very important time. <laughs> uh, this is probably a message you're going to have to really be repeating over the next, oh, let's say, four years. <laughs> four years minus three months? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I unfortunately, I wrote the album in the blind presumption that he didn't have a chance in hell. Uh, which I think most yeah. most uh, people were in a similar boat, except for his mm-hmm. rabid supporters. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there are aspects of the album where I feel like I took my eye off the ball in a, in a way. If I had known Trump would get elected, I would have written about him a lot more and the danger he poses to the sort of collective effort to deal with climate change. Because, uh, you know, if, mm-hmm. if a person can be a singular threat, he was a singular threat, although he represents the you know, tip of the spear of a whole sort of kooky climate denier subculture that's always been where that's been, you know, prominent in America more so than most countries, but hasn't really been in power, at least not for the last decade. And so now there's a, you know, there's definitely an increased level of urgency around it, which is why I just put out a new song, which is kind of like an addendum to my Climate Chaos album uh, called Erosion, which is specifically about Trump's climate change issues and and how um you know he may he may actually know more about climate change than he lets on uh one of the things i point out in the song is that he has actually applied for a permit to uh, build a seawall in his irish golf course to protect against sea level rise citing climate change as the reason uh but he's also right. dismissing it at a policy level so you know when the it's it's really you got to follow the money to understand what's going on because the people invested in fossil fuels are hoping that climate change is not taken seriously at least for a few more decades so they can cash mm-hmm. out their chips mm-hmm. on um, all of the all of the stock and oil reserves underground, uh, whereas the rest of the planet has a pretty strong interest in not letting them do that. 
we can perhaps play that that new track so people can see uh, how you're engaging in that living tradition of of holding the leaders to account through poetry too which i think is also something that definitely has a long fine long tradition in in the poetic uh, corpus yeah, the sort of anti uh, anti establishment polemics, or you know, sa mm-hmm. satire mm-hmm. skewering the the emperor, yep. or something like that. I think that's uh, definitely a tradition that I want to uphold. Yeah, and, and trying to affect social change. I don't know how much impact mm-hmm. I have. You know, does it does a rap song change any votes? And some of the biggest rock the vote effort. You got Jay Z on tour mm-hmm. with Beyonce trying mm-hmm. to promote Hillary Clinton, and you know, sometimes uh, sometimes the artists just can't do the heavy lifting on this stuff no but at least you know that if you have a voice and you've used it for what you think is important you haven't been silent on it you know you have that you have a yeah. platform whatever that platform is you can at least know you haven't made things worse <laughs> yeah <laughs> I and I, can... I do think there's a, there's an emboldening effect as well as when you hear yeah. people speak out yeah. then you feel emboldened to speak out as well it, it mm-hmm. normalizes dissent and i think i you know if even if i'm just contributing to that aspect of it without specifically persuading people it's worthwhile yeah but it does you know make me think this is some, something that that it occurred to me listening to a number of your your tracks that rap is a sort of ideal medium in a way for dealing with controversy for as an agent of social change for getting into debates i mean it's it's a debate medium in a lot of ways yeah and i i think beyond that it because it comes from such a combative place and the sort of battle tradition mm-hmm. and the competitiveness of whose voice ends up going on the mic and whose voice ends up getting silenced i think rap has sort of evolved to be strong statements confident statements it you know it really it, it's a, it's got a swagger to it that's almost inherent to the genre that lends itself really well to uh politicized and and to scientific debates and to just sort of a hot button topics because you know hot button topics that are debated in a whisper that can end up getting overwhelmed so i think uh, rap rap mm-hmm. is definitely like mm-hmm. given me a strong voice mode uh that i you know i'm not i'm not like a shout from the rooftops kind of person in my daily life let's say but when it comes to making a rap mm-hmm. song i can get into this mindset of like lay down the gauntlet and and you know really take a take a strong shot at something and um i think that you know it's empowering and it also it also works really well it's not like i invented that mode but i appreciate the fact that it exists as a medium to speak through yeah i mean <laughs> when we were thinking about talking to you i thought is there any other genre that you could do the same thing because obviously i i understand why you pick on rap specifically or hip-hop specifically as being the continuation of that kind of lyric poetry and 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 oral poetry but pop songs and other music to a certain extent has always had a claim on being you know popular music in general as more widely as being and a continuation of the oral poetic tradition and there's been music around but it's i was wondering you know could you do the same kind of thing both the controversial topics but also the um, didactic approach the sort of teaching approach can that could that happen in another genre could there be pop songs that did the same thing Uh, and that's an open question like i really don't know if it could happen I, I think about that a lot in terms of like why is rap special and why you know why why do I set it aside as sort of uniquely well suited to what I'm trying to do with it and, and its potential. I think part of it is is just about the words per minute of it. You know, because melodies right. end up being sort of pronounced longer, you you just have you probably have, you know, three to five times as many words in an average rap song as you do in an average pop song Mm -hmm. so you can say more with rap but also um, you know the genre has been built around the expectations of storytelling and and having something to say Mm -hmm. Uh, the Mm -hmm. second you know the first rap song that came out was seven minutes long with no chorus just you know that that's rap rappers delight just telling stories for seven straight minutes and then the second rap song that came out was the message or not that came out that sort of got big right right uh, broken glass everywhere, you know, people pissing on the steps, you know, they just don't care is a sort of like vignette of what ghetto life is like and, and all the hardships mm-hmm. people experience mm-hmm. there. And, um, you know, pop, pop music has been mostly defined by, by love songs and, and sort of, let's say, the expression of basic emotions in song form. Whereas right. rap since the right. beginning has been a bit more complex in terms of telling a story and having social criticism be part of its sort of raison d'etre. So I think even though people don't have the expectations of rap being used as a medium to explain necessarily like 
earth sciences or <laughs> Darwinian medicine or the various things that I apply it to, it's not as far of a leap as if I was doing a, a, a pop song about it. Also, uh, I should add that I, I can't really sing, so it's not an option for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, one should always work to one's strengths, of course. <laughs> yeah, I, I the one interesting place that's sort of a little parallel is, is uh, I was thinking, you know, could you have a musical like that? And of course, Hamilton gives you that. But of course, that's because Hamilton is itself not in the standard musical genre. I mean, it's an explaining, it's a history teaching, but it's in the hip hop as, uh, genre, at least in part as well. Yeah, Hamilton is definitely the the gold standard in terms of, you know, having a serious message and a story to tell and really being musical and lyrical and and balancing entertainment value and and uh, and a serious side. I was I I'm really impressed with it as a as a work of creative art with a real hip hop hip hop core to it. So, um, you know, I uh, I I'm a, I'm a fan of Lin Manuel Miranda. I also uh, mm-hmm. met him at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival when we were both just hustling flyers on the street back in 2005. He was doing a show called oh, yeah. Freestyle Love Supreme there, and um, you know that 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 hip hop theater thing has been percolating for years. But Hamilton right. is you know it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a tough one to beat. <laughs> yeah, for for him as well, I think in a way, <laughs> such a not that he's in any way a, a one hit wonder, but just. That it it was so monumentally successful, it's going to be a hard uh, act to follow for everybody. Well, I think that one really good thing about it is that it's changed a lot of people's minds about what rap and hip hop are capable of. Yeah. The, the response yeah. I get from audiences a lot from my live shows, especially older audiences, is you know I never I never thought of rap that way before. But if that's rap, then I guess you know I guess it's not so bad after all. Like I <laughs> I've been getting that response from years since I was doing the Canterbury Tales and through all the right. science stuff and everything. Right. But in terms of this the sort of sheer like indisputable star power of of Hamilton you know mm-hmm. that that effect that I've been having on 100 people at a time doing my one man shows it's having on millions of people all at once it's great yeah so the next question that I had you know given that you're doing so much and you're taking on all these you know you take on a a whole new area with each album, how do you keep up with it all? I mean, how do you keep up with both the sort of the musical side, you know, the skills, but also all these interdisciplinary topics and performing all the time and you have to do all your promotion. How do you keep up with all of that? I'm a pretty big workaholic. That's part of it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the performing side, um, you know, I don't perform to hone my skills anymore. I perform to pay the bills at this point. Right. So, you know, I probably do like 100 shows a year on average, and that's wow. where all my income comes from. And then um, in terms of the research side of it, you know, I'm I'm always reading, listening to audio books, um, mm-hmm. just on the web, reading articles, and uh, trying to, you know, stay stay abreast of the topics I'm interested in reading ahead, you know, even though I'm still performing the climate change show, um, it's pretty much written at this point. So I don't really have to research that show anymore, except I have to keep up with, you know, new developments in the field, but the sort of basic mm-hmm. science um, is, is already in the show. So for, for months now, I've been reading, you know, neuroscience and uh, philosophy of mind and, and consciousness related stuff, which is a totally new and daunting field to really get into. Um, but, but fascinating. Also, my wife, is a neuroscientist so I kind of uh, I absorb this stuff at home quite a lot as well and um, right. yeah so it's just I've always got sort of half an eye on the horizon about what the next project is and musically I have this great team of collaborators um, somebody recently one of my uh, one of my friends who sings hooks on a bunch of my songs Aaron Nazrul he said you're like the Barry Gordy of the science rap world because uh, because <laughs> I've got this um, you know this coterie of sort of go-to musicians where I'm like okay I got this beat I'm working on a song about this I'm going to send it to this guy he's going to do a guitar set i'm going to send it to this female vocalist she's going to come up with a hook melody which i'll then work on the words for and then send it somewhere else for keys and then send it to england and that's where the mix engineer (laughs) is putting together the you know and then the beat comes and then this track comes out like 10 days later you know after 10 people worked on it um because i've just over over the years i've built up this great collaborative network of people that i know what they're capable of and i can sort of achieve any sound that i can imagine just by getting it in the right hands even though i don't 
don't play any instruments or really uh, have a, <laughs> you know, carry a tune. I can <laughs> come up with a concept for a melody and, and work with a, a professional vocalist to sort of find the right uh, grooves for the notes that I have in mind but can't even come close to singing. And uh, the outcome, I tend to think, sounds pretty good, even though if I tried to make it by myself, uh, it would be hopeless, which is kind of analogous to the... Uh, you know, the contemporary economy that we live in, where, for instance, I'm, mm-hmm. uh, as I speak right now, I'm holding an Apple mouse in my hand. Well, nobody knows how to make an Apple mouse. Um, you know, <laughs> a- a- Apple gets credit for having designed it, but there's probably like a thousand people's work from the, from the mine of the fossil fuels and the metals to the part manufacturers, the design process mm-hmm. and everything, you know, so um, I get credit for the songs that I put out, but a lot of people have their hands on them first. Yeah, for sure. The uh, the specialization, I mean, that's one of the that's one of the problems we're always trying to kind of it's hard to see the big picture and and to find the productive connections. That's mm-hmm. one of the things that we we're always interested in talking about ourselves and why we like talking to people who do that themselves because of those the need for both intense specialization and intense Cross, cross-pollination. Yeah, well, I guess, it, I mean, it is the case that lots of people work on my songs, but those musicians wouldn't spontaneously assemble into a song about the Darwinian roots of cancer biology or whatever it is that I'm getting them to work on at any <laughs> given moment. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a, a unique locus to serve as a bridge between the academics and the music and entertainment world. But um, I have a lot of fun with it. I don't know how I stumbled on it. It definitely, you know, I it wasn't like my aha moment when I was tree planting was I'm going to one day explain evolutionary biology and every <laughs> other science subject in the form of rap albums. Uh, it wasn't close to that. It was just like, oh, there's an uncanny resemblance between poetry in England 500 years ago and rap today. And stepwise, that somehow led me into science communication via hip hop career. Yeah. Now you mention uh, or you, you describe your a lot of your stuff as a, uh peer-reviewed rap so what does it what what does that entail in terms of the peer review aspect of it so the academic or the uh, informational part of it what how do you do that well i usually have a scientific expert in the field that is my advisor on a project right from the beginning so um, sometimes it's one sometimes it's several some of the rap guides have actually been commissioned by somebody where they go and get a grant and then they hire me to Um, be the expositor of the field. So, for instance, the Rap Guide to Medicine was commissioned by Randy Nessie, who is um, a a medical doctor, but also a sort of pioneer in the field of Darwinian medicine, and now Mm -hmm. a professor at Arizona State, and he brought put the funds together, and then um, was also my peer review expert, because he's one of the founders of this field. He's published a book called Why We Get Sick, about the sort of evolutionary physiology uh, basis of a lot of diseases, And um, so everything in the album, I'm writing the lyrics and then I'm sending them to him and saying, do you have any feedback on this song? Is there anything missing? Should I add anything? And he's coming back with notes while also forwarding the lyrics to people that are more specialized in whatever um, sub discipline I, I, I'm right. touching on. Right. So, you know, that's that's one model. Uh, Anil Seth is a neuroscientist in the UK who's the primary consultant on my new one, Rap Guide to Consciousness. Um, with Climate Chaos, I sort of started writing it uh, on my own steam because I didn't really have uh, an academic that was ready to collaborate right off the jump, but I just knew it was a subject that was urgent and you know that that would f- sort of fit as the next step in my in my series and I and I wanted to devote some attention to it so I started working on it and then once I had a draft of the script I I started reaching out to people and then getting their comments so that by the time I finished it I could call it peer reviewed even though it didn't right. start as peer reviewed right. but you know the the idea is that the the end goal is that when I stand on stage and do a performance I'm representing the broad consensus of scientific orthodoxy which is right. probably like the least rebellious sounding thing for a rapper <laughs> to say <laughs> but in a way uh, i feel like defending scientific orthodoxy is something of a radical position in today's world because a lot of yeah i would say i would say that's right ignoring science is causing misery on multiple scales throughout people's lives and if we just listen to the scientific consensus on lots of subjects from vaccines to evolution to climate change everyone would be happier and healthier and better off really so you know obviously there's such things as 
red herrings and science doesn't always get it exactly right. But when almost all the scientists agree on the evidence base of a particular thing I th and, and it runs contrary to the sort of popular opinion on it, my my tendency is to think that the popular opinions like m miss the point somehow. And that's where I see myself as a possible bridge mm -hmm. uh, to, to bring the, mm -hmm. the expertise to the to the populace. Yeah. By the way, I presume that's your uh, your baby in the background. <laughs> yeah, that's my my son Dylan trying to get on the mic here right yeah. next to me. Um, he's lovely. a he's a very vocal that's little lovely. boy. He's just he's three and a half months old. Right. <laughs> so he's just starting to try to get in on the conversation. <laughs> that's lovely. You know the the thing that I find interesting about that element of. Um, you know, scientific communication and trying to get the, as it were, scientific consensus or the scientific orthodoxy out is while on the one hand, rap comes out of this oral tradition from ages ago of, of poetry, uh, there's also a, a way in which what you're doing has very deep roots in uh, literary poetry, in very specific field of didactic poetry. Uh, I know that you know Erasmus Darwin and his poetic approach to science Erasmus Darwin is one of Mark's yeah, favorite. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Erasmus Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> he tries to work him in into everything he possibly can. I mean, so he wrote a poem, a, a pre-evolutionary poem, obviously. He's, um, for those who are listening, he's Charles Darwin's grandfather. grandfather. Yeah. And he wrote a poem about uh, the origin of life uh, that was pre-evolutionary because he didn't know that, though he... He had his own sort of proto-evolutionary yeah. ideas. Yeah, he, uh, he understood about species morphing into each other and life being continuous. Yeah. He had no mechanism to explain how it happened. Yeah, yeah. he saw things as, as a pr process of change. He just yeah. hadn't done the, uh, put it all together. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, he, he's coming out of a tradition. I know very specifically that Darwin, Erasmus Darwin is working out of the Lucretian tradition. So Lucretius is a Roman poet from the f uh, first century BC who wrote, a poem about science, trying to popularize science by means of poetry, you know, the didactic poem. I mean, De rerum natura. Exactly. And I mean, the science was philosophy, but, you know, it's atomism and Democritus and the idea of uh, he was doing his best to find, you know, it, again, it was maybe not the scientific consensus because that's not quite what it was, but it was uh, the best science of his day or one of the one of the competing best sciences of his day. And he uses that metaphor that has become, I think, quite famous in some circles. I always am not sure what's actually famous in the world outside of my classics bubble, but that he used poetry to communicate his science bec like a doctor puts honey on the cup of medicine to make somebody drink the better, bitter medicine. Is that, is that a Lucretian line? I didn't know that. Yeah, that's Lucretius. He says that just as a doctor smears the cup with honey so that people will drink the bitter dregs of medicine, he has try he is trying to use the poet the honey of the muses to make his information more palatable. And I think that that, that tradition and you know Lucretius is is a latecomer in a way to that tradition. The whole Hellenistic Greek world was filled with poems that were didactic, like poems about all the rivers in the world listed in poetic form or about astronomy or about snakes. That's one of the ones that's lost and it's very sad because I wish I, there was a whole didactic poem on snakes still survived. But, you know, there's this idea that using poetry is a way of making otherwise unpalatable information palatable. And I think that in that sense, even though you're doing something very non-literary in the sense that it's not written down and part of that read tradition, it does come out of those roots as well. Yeah, it's funny because I, I, is, I, what you're talking about is something that I associate with Chaucer, but it actually goes back a lot further than that. Uh, in the Canterbury Tales, uh, Chaucer talks about how the gold standard for the tale telling of the pilgrims has to be for the sentence uh, and solace of the listeners. So it has to mean something. It has to have right. sentence, a point, but it has to have solace or solace. It has to be enjoyable as well. And uh, I think I think one of the scholars that was analyzing that said Chaucer probably got that from Horace, which has uh, reference to delectere e docere. Right. It's the sort of yes, it's got to yes. be in informative and enjoyable at the same time. So I've always always held that out as my ideal for for a great work of literary mm -hmm. art, whether it's rap or poetry or music or a novel or whatever is, you know, not shallow, but not boring. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's in fact why I was looking up Horace earlier and came on that other uh, passage was I, I know that Horace also, he specifically in his satire says that, uh, again, he's using some humor and some poetry to make his point, his, his philosophical and moral point in that case, uh, just as a school teacher uses cookies to bribe his students to learn their ABCs. So same idea. There we go. I'm the, I'm the scientific cookie dispenser right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. So, yeah, so I think it's really uh, it's fascinating to see these connections and how how they do trace back either consciously or unconsciously. Yeah, every every new project I, I'm approaching, the, the goal is to try to strike that balance as best as possible. Mm -hmm. But you're usually starting with some really dry academic work. And then the challenge yeah. is to try to extract the kernels of of intrigue out of it um which you know it, it's like it's like coal mining for diamonds uh because it's not you know it's not it's not a lot of the time it's just really hard to see what's intriguing about it um but you know it works the best when you find something that's totally intrinsic to the subject and not just paste it over top of it uh that that yeah. Yeah. is mind-blowing in its own way or connects in some unexpected way. Uh, in the Rap Guide to Evolution, it was the the concept of uh, costly signaling theory, which could explain peacock's tails and bling at the same time. And, you right. know, this whole idea of bling, right. you know, pe peacock's tails being like nature's bling, like that's a kind of all, all you have to say in a way, you know, it's like a, it's like a, well, obviously there's a lot more to say, but it's a very intuitively um, graspable mm -hmm. perspective. People sort of get yeah. a feeling about the bling that they see on, uh, you know, MTV or, or love and hip hop as kind of, um, you know, slightly ostentatious and ridiculous, but at the same time sort of mesmerizing and you can't look away from it and think there's mm -hmm. something deeper going on there. And, and there is really, there's something sort of biologically deeper uh, about the mm -hmm. instinct to display and flaunt and, and, um, you know, so that that became sort of like an insight that from which a whole bunch of material would naturally flow. And right now I'm in the I'm in the weeds with this consciousness stuff, <laughs> trying to trying to find the <laughs> insight find that. that's got yeah. that's got that same sort of s springboard effect where it leads to lots of other uh, in aha kind of stuff. But I, I can't say I've got a lot yet. I'm still like deep in neuroscience <laughs> papers right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, both Mark and I try to uh, to do that on a on a smaller, much smaller scale. Uh, t to do that, you know, communication. It's not science communication for us; it's humanities communication. But the same way, trying to find those moments. Yeah, those th those that interesting analogy or that interesting connection. Yeah, that will draw someone in and give them a piece of information along the way that yeah. they can take back, whether it's like factual or or more about how to look at the world or, or a new ana analytical lens or something. And that's that's very much what Mark is doing with his uh, videos is trying to use etymology as his particular lens just because people like to know where words come from. That's one of the things that makes people intrigued. And if you can use that as a, as a way into understanding other things about language and history, that's a fun thing. So I totally get the, the impulse and, and we yeah. too struggle with it. And it's hard, especially when you're working, I find with myself, when it's your specialty. You know, I think that your perspective as being a, a bit of an outsider to these fields probably helps. Is Yeah, probably one of your biggest strengths in yeah. a way um, is being able to see it from the outside mm -hmm. and convey that. Well, because, you know, everything about my subject is fascinating. So it's hard for me to discern <laughs> what will be fascinating to somebody else because I just think it's amazing. But that doesn't mean it's amazing to anybody else. So I need that outside eye, I think. Yeah, that's that. It is the case that we get we get sort of it's it's sort of like when you move to a new place and you're trying to gauge how annoying the travel is to your nearest transit spot is yeah. for the first couple yeah. of months. You're like, oh, my God, this is so f far. But the longer you live there, the shorter the commute feels. Um, which is sort of like the closeness you come to feel to a subject that you be, that you get familiar with. It's, what do you mean? This is all inherently fascinating, isn't it? But you have to be outside it to realize it's not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that or or to see how much background knowledge is necessary to find that particular nugget fascinating. You know, if you have to explain, 
for three hours in order to make I always tell my students uh, I, I know that the best jokes are the ones that I have to do five minutes of explanation before and another two minutes of unpacking after those are the <laughs> best jokes <laughs> the telling class oh this is a really funny uh, poem that by uh, Catullus uh, let me give you a six minute lecture so that you know how funny it is by the end of it and it's those moments where I realize that I'm too deep in the weeds we, I'll be in uh, New York uh, tonight performing uh, a show called Off the Top that I do with my wife who's a neuroscientist, mm -hmm. Heather Berlin is her name, and we, we do this show together called Off the Top, which is actually a comedy. It's not a hip-hop theater show like the other ones I've done, um, and it's about... Uh, the neuroscience of improvisation. So, um, in right. you know, I, I, I relate to that because we've been trying to sort of mine neuroscience for jokes and some of the <laughs> jokes we've tried out in the show, um, you know, have fallen flat for that exact reason. Um, I, I, yeah. I tried to borrow one from my favorite joke from Ghostbusters is where Dan Aykroyd says to the Egon Spangler character, I can't remember, Harold Ramis might be the actor, I can't remember exactly, but he says, Egon, the girls must really dig that big cranium of yours. And Egon says, actually, I think they're more interested in my epididymis. Um, so we tried to put an epididymis <laughs> reference into the show, but, you know, for I, like a lot of people have to look up epididymis. It's uh, part of the anatomy of the of the testicles and uh, it's like associated with the seminal vesicle. So, you know, he's basically saying it's my genetic <laughs> quality that they're more attractive to, not my cranium, um, which is a kind of evolutionary peacock statement. But it also requires the yeah. anatomical knowledge to really get it. So there was a time in the show when we had an epididymis reference because it kind of sounds like part of the brain and i was like mm -hmm. you know my wife was into my cranium no she was into my epididymis and this, <laughs> like crickets <laughs> in the room i'm like okay probably you know maybe we need to <laughs> save that one for the society of anatomist conference or something <laughs> yeah actually that makes me uh, just reminds me it's a bit of an off topic but uh one of my favorite latin poets is catullus and every time i teach him in recent years anyway i've had people discussing how much his poetry, especially his uh, love slash hate poetry, is like certain kinds of rap and certain kinds of uh, diss tracks because it's all about how much of a whore his girlfriend is after she dumps him and things like that. A bunch of other ones about the men she's with. and it, it, Poetry is shame culture and uh, public humiliation as a way of getting back at people. So and, uh, sounds like a clear forebear to Eminem right there. Yeah, exactly. I actually had somebody in class last week say, um, it was Latin poetry all just Taylor Swift writing about her exes? And I was like, yeah, pretty much. That pretty much covers it. <laughs> Sorry, that's a bit off topic. Nothing is off topic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, that is the right approach, right? To being able to do anything with anything. But this sort of, you know, reminds me, you know, the idea of the, the sort of rap battle and one rather more obscure track of yours that you did with uh, <laughs> Professor Elemental, What's Your English? How Which is a totally, it was completely up our alley because we're both obviously language people. And yeah, and, uh, yeah it, was, it was very fun to find that. <laughs> How did that come about? Um, that came about because Macmillan Dictionary reached out to me and said, we love your Chaucer rap. Could you do a song about English philology and, and slang uh, you know, evolution. And I was friends with Professor Elemental. He's one of the first rappers that I met when I first did some shows in Brighton back in 2004 uh, is when we first started hanging out. So I, uh, you know, I, I thought he had, the, um, he, had, he had the right attitude and style for it. So um, I was in Brighton at the time and I pitched it to him and he liked the concept. So uh, we just sat down and made lists. Unfortunately, the list of Canadian slang that I had to draw from was pretty impoverished i have to admit like like maybe it's yeah. because you know we're a, we're a much younger country so fewer things have had an opportunity to evolve there linguistically but uh you, you know when i wrote down my list of english slang words that i wanted to put the song and put in the song i probably had a, you know one word to every 10 of his uh and then we had to <laughs> you know weed because british slang is rich and varied um but yeah, then yeah. you know then we had to weed his down to the ones that would have counterparts for me <laughs> yeah we just don't have the we also don't have the re regionalisms i don't know if you were able to uh i don't remember how many newfoundland words there were in that that's probably our best 
best source of, of regional, regional slang, slang yeah. is Newfoundland. Yeah, but and you know, I'm and I'm from Vancouver, so you want to talk about yeah. a young country? <laughs> that's like the most recently populated part of a young country yeah. when it yeah. comes to the to the yeah. to the European language float, flowing there and 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 evolving there. Mm-hmm. So you're right. If I was if I was uh, if I was from uh, Newfoundland, I'm sure I would have had more to draw from. Yeah, but on the other hand, most other Canadians probably wouldn't have recognized most Newfoundland slang. That's so because mm. it's so regionally spe- specific. So yeah, now that was a it was a very fun track. And uh, I, I emailed with uh, Professor Elemental there a couple a couple months ago, and we've been you know we've al- we've always said oh we should do another song one of these days because he's you know he's really uh, yeah. yeah continued to be successful as well uh, and put out lots of albums mm-hmm. and tours and performs and everything. So um, you know that was yeah. that was back in our in our. Um, you know, early MC days that we made that song, but we haven't right. followed up with another collaboration. So we should really do that one of these days. Yeah, I'd love that to hear that. Cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that track. Actually, I'm putting together a new course for next year on history of the English language. And I like the, the utility of that track for teaching language change. regional variation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an online course. So Mark's using lots and lots of uh, YouTube sources, videos yeah. and other online sources as uh, required reading for the students. Well, if you, I don't know if you've seen the, the TED talk I did at TEDx Navisync about the history of polysyllabic rhyme uh, in the English language going back to Chaucer, but you might want to look at that one as well. Yeah, definitely. That sounds fascinating. Good. Yeah, we'll f- certainly look for that. And, and by the way, for people listening, we will obviously be putting links to everything we've mentioned in the show notes. And we'll play, uh, Baba has said we can play a couple of clips so we'll, we'll play a track or two at the end so everybody can get a, a sample of your most recent work and maybe a Chaucer track as well because I think that uh, our listeners would would be interested in that particular connection yeah. but we should probably let you go because I as you said you have a, a show, show tonight. tonight and we've kept you for an hour now and uh, we need to go look at our uh, the, the video that we just put out which is uh, on the word evolution and how the word evolution shows the evolution of words and how language change works. Yeah. So uh, beautiful. I love I love meta projects like that. Yeah. <laughs> a, a little while ago, Mark did a, a video on the etymology of the word etymology, etymology. Hmm. Yeah. and that was also entertaining for us. It makes us giggle. That's close enough. <laughs> but thank you so much for giving us so much of your time and and telling us about your work uh so you've got right now you're touring with climate chaos are you yeah i'm doing it at at colleges and uh science festivals and also some high schools uh all over the u.s for the for the spring and then as of may i'll be um premiering my rap guide to consciousness show in brighton and then working on that for the summer uh and and then bring it to edinburgh and hopefully to off broadway in new york if it if it does well but first i have to make it hot (laughs) <laughs> All right. So uh, does your website have uh, upcoming dates uh, if we point people there? Yeah. Yeah. The, the main uh, okay. BubbaBrinkman.com site has my, uh, my, my touring calendar right on the front page. And I uh, love to see people at a show. Or if you can't get to a show, I'm all, all over iTunes, Bandcamp, YouTube. So check out some of the music and um, hopefully you won't believe your ears. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. And I know that you, you're you findable on your website, uh, you're on Twitter. I know everywhere Baba Brinkman will find you, right? There are no others on the planet that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> Useful uh, uniqueness to your name. Great. Well, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. This has been a real treat for us. Well, it's been a pleasure for me, too. Thanks for, uh, <laughs> thanks for delving deep. And uh, we'll keep uh, an eye out or ear out for upcoming work. And... Uh, Good luck saving the planet for us all. Thanks for your work. (laughs) Yeah. Needed now more than ever, I think. All right. My pleasure. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Bye. Ciao. Mr. Donald Trump, you're not my president Cause I'm not a citizen, just another immigrant A permanent resident, stuck in the midst of it Rubbernecking as America drove off a cliff Thinking I wish I could vote, but not for you though Hell no, I voted for Justin Trudeau Here's a couple things that I think you know Even if you act in public like you don't Climate change, you know that is happening Know that its impact is already damaging You said so, a permit you applied for Said the ocean's coming up on your Irish golf course 
here's another place you might like to protect America, it's likewise under threat Sea level rise, extreme weather events Infrastructure risk is bad for business So I made a list to help you keep track And since you don't read, I squeezed it in a wrap Or to put it in a tweet if I could achieve that The seaside's about to need an evac Erosion of coastlines, riverbeds Of time left, only chance we're gonna get Erosion of ice in the glaciers, United Nations isolation, erosion of faith in democracy, your face in the dictionary next to hypocrisy, erosion, erosion, erosion. Mr. President, sticking your head in the sand is not principled. The rate of sea level rise in Florida tripled in one decade, and that's easy to count. It's back when Billy Bush and you were hanging around, demonstrating your scruples. And since those days, the tidal flooding in Miami Beach has quadrupled. And that's great for business if you sell water pumps, but not for local residents who voted Donald Trump. So what you gonna do now? Lose Mar-a-Lago or try to move it all to higher ground in Colorado? Some people try to tell me that you're all bravado, but I think you've got to calculate under all the guano. Come on though, what's Tampa supposed to do if another storm floods the bay with raw sewage? Is the EPA gonna stop the fluid spewing? Not under Scott Pruitt, all he wants to do is sue it. And what about common sense, national defense? You got several naval bases under imminent threat. It's not just the Gulf Coast, Hampton Roads about to have some of Virginia's dampest homes. Erosion of waterfront property, insurance underwriters can't even make a profit. Erosion of the public trust, coal burners fill Filling up our lungs with dust Erosion Of real estate value Seawater coming up to surround you Erosion 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 Mr. President, you know the fire season's out of control Losses have doubled since I was six years old With damage in the hundreds of millions We lost a whole town in Canada's wilderness, you know Climate change is a factor The Pentagon calls it a risk enhancer So why do you act like you don't know With every new quote that it's a huge hoax I really do want to take the charitable view Basic ignorance, that's embarrassing for you But it's not as bad as the uncharitable view That you're funneling profit it's the fossil fuel and getting kickbacks There's a lot of gas to burn And we don't know what you own No tax return All we know is you got a lot of fossil fuel cronies in your cabinet And Tillerson and Putin are homies And those with the most to gain from the claim That climate change is a hoax Are praying that you can delay the clean energy transition Long enough to cash a few chips in Erosion Of journalistic standards We want answers, not panders Erosion Of public institutions Of safeguards against pollution, erosion, of civilization, it's not too late to make changes, erosion, 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 Mr. President, erosion. One that April, with his shores soaked, the drought of March had pierced to the road and bathed every vein in switch liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the fluor and. Uh, uh, wait a second. Let me start over. It was April. You know, when those sweet rain showers come and soak all the roots of the plants that are dried out from the drought of March, and this causes flowers to come up out of the ground. And this causes people to come up out of their houses and start going to see shows and going on trips. You know, springtime. Well, the show that I went to see in April was a hip hop show, a rap concert. Now you gotta picture it. I'm in the crowd. I'm throwing my hands in the air. I'm a fan. On stage, the rappers are busting rhymes. They're battling DJs are scratching records. It's such entertaining stuff, this whole hip hop phenomenon. After the show, I was so impressed with what I saw that I thought, man, I gotta talk to these rappers. I gotta congratulate them. Nah, I'm gonna get their autograph. So I sneak around to the back of the club to see if I can see where the rappers went. And in the alley behind the club, I can see this tour bus idling there, all black and chrome. Looks expensive. I'm like, yeah, it's gotta be them. So I sneak up to it. There's no one around. I look on board. It looks empty. So, you know, thought I'd take a look. Up onto the bus I'd go. 
In the back of the bus, there's this lounge with couches, chairs, a mini bar, turntables. Looks plush. I'm like, yeah, this must be where they chill when they're on tour. Sweet. There was no one there, though, so I thought I'd just, you know, take a seat and see what happens. I kept expecting security to show up at any second and be like, VIP only, son, you can't be on the bus. But they never did. And then, as I sat there, the rappers started coming up onto the bus all around me. Same rappers I had just seen on stage. They started taking seats, chilling out, pouring themselves drinks. DJ sparked up the records. But none of them even noticed me. It's like I was invisible sitting there. And then, the bus geared up and drove away. So I was a stowaway on this bus. And what I'm here to tell you today is exactly what I saw and what I heard that night. I'll tell you what these rappers did behind the scenes. I'll tell you the stories they told. But I have to say first, these are not my stories. I didn't make them up. I'm just a messenger. I'm just telling you what other people said. So I can accept no praise or blame for anything that I say. Keep that in mind. So we're cruising along the highway. The first thing that happens is the manager of the tour, who we'll just call the host. He comes up into the back of the bus like a whirlwind, like, What's up, y'all? That was a tight show. We blew this town up. They love this, y'all. What's up? One of those hip-hop promoter types, you know? He's like, all right, check this out, y'all. We got a couple hours to kill now between this town and the next town. Now, I know y'all tired from the show, because the show was tight. But I'm thinking we need to keep our skills sharp, y'all. We can't just be chilling. So we're going to have a battle right now to help pass the time along the way. But no freestyles. This here is gonna be a storytelling battle. I want y'all to tell me tales, your illest rhymes, your dopest narratives, and I'm gonna be the judge. So you got to make me happy. And the winner, I will buy him a gourmet meal or something. Now check it out. You're first. I, right, I'm gonna do this. Now y'all know me. I'm still the same OG, but I've been low key. Now I got this career that all y'all envy now. I'm the oldest veteran in this place, you know, my style kinda like rock him. I've been battling since I was young, y'all. And since I've been in so many battles, y'all can call me the knight. Now listen up. I got a story for y'all from ancient Greece. That's right, this here's an epic. DJ, are you ready? Drop the beat. The Knight's Tale. As history teaches us, it happened to be that Theseus, the governor of Athens in Greece, attacked and besieged with wisdom and honor the land of the Amazon women and conquered and he wedded their queen, Ippolita. Along with her young sister, Emily, his plundered possessions, Theseus met them with a humble reception and he let them come back with him under protection from hundreds of weapons to Athens and kept them. Upon his return to Greece, Theseus learned of these awful and shameful, dishonored injustices huh? brought to the name of the monarch, entrusted what? with keeping the city of Thebes. In the dust with his power obsolete, uh. in a coward's defeat, he now was deceased and cast out in the streets where the hounds with their teeth would devour his meat. His widow the queen, in her hour of need, showered pleas on Theseus from down on her knees, so he proudly agreed to put the town under siege, and surrounded Thebes with all his men, and pounded the city's walls, and when those towers were downfallen, then his troops to dust demolished them. And when the brawl was ended, he finally obtained and returned to the Thebian queen for her pains, the rest of her husband's majestic remains. Now deep in the wreckage the people were left with, two knights were detected of high blood suspected since birth from the first had their paths intersected, though now were dejected, and it was expected they would be dead soon from the head wounds inflicted. But Theseus ordered that they be protected, and he sent them to Athens where they could be hidden. And by his decision, the two knights were given a prison to live in, though they were forbidden to step from within till their ghosts had uprisen. The names of these knights, in plain language, are seated and Palamon. Utterly thankless that they were not hanged with the rest of the vanquished, they were caged in a tower for ages to languish and waste away hours and days with their anguish. 
Years passed till at last on a bright May morning, Emily rose as dawn was just forming to walk in the garden with flowers adorning her head as a tribute to spring and her singing as soft as an angel's rose up and just happened to waft in a window and cause a distraction. And that's when the passionate noise then uprose to where Palamon paced, giving voice to his woes. Woe is me, he cried. Whoa. <laughs> and then he sees her. Whoa. 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 <laughs> Palamon, struck to the quick by this vision, in his heart, he was lust to conflict his religion. I mean, she looked like a goddess. And perhaps will forgive him if he thought she was Venus and asked for deliverance. As he felt an upsurging of happiness in him, a hope was emerging that perhaps she would give him a premature evacuation from prison. <gasps> Meanwhile, Arcita had noticed the cracks in his cousin's demeanor and focus and asked him, Why are you looking so hopeless? What's happened? What have you seen to provoke this reaction? And Palamon sighed and said, I'm choked with such passion for her that I see down below, yet I'm trapped in this prison, my station the lowest in Athens. Until I escape, I'll have no satisfaction. Hmm. See, Palamon had gazed and had paid the price. And Arcita now bravely laid his eyes, amazed upon the maiden guise of Emily. And to his great surprise, she made him sigh and feel as sore inside as Palamon. And more, Arcita fell to the stone and swore this fresh beauty and peerless grace has rescued me. It clears away the sorrow of this dreary place. If only she'd appear each day, I'd cheerfully stay here just to see her face. Palamon's answer was close to delirious. Be clear with this, brother. Are you joking or serious? Choking on tears, his emotions were furious. Arcita just sneered at this like I would never say. Anything as heavyweight as this merely in clever play. And Palamon felt his pleasure fade. Well, then you have betrayed me and openly broken your oath to me. Plainly, by both of us spoken so faithfully, traded to pose as a token of total devotion. We must put that above any quarrel we have over matters of love. All we have is our blood, and that is a trust rather tough to just patch up after it's cut. Arcita laughed as if touched with a covered smirk and said another word. Since you loved her first, I'm supposed to pretend like it doesn't hurt me and I'm not even allowed to covet her. Although it is I who suffers worse, why should I thirst while my brother flirts? It's enough to reverse one's trusted word. Now their hate and need were great indeed, and it made them seethe impatiently, but destiny soon gave them leave of one another's company. For soon enough, it would come to be that Arcita was ungratefully released, cause Theseus was under siege from a friend of Arcita's of some degree, who had come to speak and give humble pleas that Arcita, despite what he'd done, should be freed. Theseus agreed, but he made one decree that once released from his country, if Arcita came Within a, a hundred feet of Athens He'd soon be underneath the axe And be beheaded violently So he returned to abide in Thebes Now try and see the irony Palamon was left in the tyrant's keep With shackled hands and iron feet But every day his eyes could peek at Emily And all her vibrancy while Arcita was unconfined, yet he was not allowed inside the city of Athens. And if he tried to sneak or slyly creep by, it'd be like a deadly game of hide and seek. So Emily was outside his reach. But it's up to you to decide which of these two nights' bleak lives was the highest defeat. Hmm. Yeah, that's the end of scene one. This is epic, right? Epic. Now check it out. Scene 2. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. 
We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.